my my El Cheapo Chinese lens filter. Mm-hmm. You know what MD5. I did? Hmm? I got a piece of foam. I made a ring out of it, no. and then I and I and then I glued a piece of that Bader film to it, yep. mm-hmm. and it fits well. over my lens. Yeah, yeah, yep. and perfect. Yeah. Okay. Celestron, you know, and I think one other company has a has a thing that'll go over your camera, but I don't know how good the fit fit would be on the I do a rubber band and just a rubber band around the lens and the film around it. That's yeah, usually good be. enough for a single use, obviously. But um but Robert, you have the um is that the thin metallic um like yeah. bar from yeah. Beta? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh yeah, they, they sell it well this what I bought they sell six by six inch sheets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've used it before. I've actually made that same kind of thing for binoculars. Um, uh, no, I take that back. I bought a special purpose set of things for binoculars, but I've used that before for this. When I took this picture during the partial phases, I used a, a this was done with a point and shoot camera. Mm. And, you know, yeah. not a great picture, but it, it worked. And Better than nothing. <laughs> Better than no picture. You know. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I used that for the partial phases, and it worked great. Yeah, in 2017, I had some. Well, I still have some sheets of that stuff left over, but I have the um, uh, the heavier, the black plastic. Yeah, and um, which is luminized one side, and I had sheets up there. And people who had various binoculars and had forgotten to bring filters. We just chopped it up and, as Daniel was saying, used a rubber band, um, oversized sheets, just folded over the, the objectives of the binoculars, and it worked fine. Yeah. Yeah, you did that with the Trench of Mercury at the Autonomous Society, I think. I think I did that with my one I had my 120 Esprit back when I had that thing. Yeah. I just rubber band, it worked great. But I think the Bader, the Bader film, because Dan Ward did a test. Mm-hmm. comparing them and the beta film is is a bit sharper mm. okay but then the question is will the seeing be good enough <laughs> to take yeah. advantage yeah of the sharpness no I mean, one, no. one problem one problem with this eclipse is it's a it's a bunch of lowland areas no yeah so my I'm question talking. is uh my question is uh i don't plan on having a guiding thing so it's going to be in a standard tripod and i'll have to adjust it every once in a while um and i think heavier's tool uh accounts for that you know if you're not guided but and tells you i think the maximum exposure you can get is like one of the third seconds yeah focal length i was doing but um i'm just wondering how much of a problem that's going to be if it's worth things that if it's worth even considering buying one of those you know Ioptron makes a a little mount. I think Skywatcher has one too, but right. then I got it. It's just more crap I got to bring. I'm going to Texas, so it's yeah. like, yeah. And, I didn't wanna, yeah. and I didn't want to bring a lot of luggage. So one of the things that, um, uh, shoot, I forget what, not Dyson, but um, anyway, one of the experts suggested was getting a slow motion tripod head. Something that's it's it's basically a, a, like a geared head or something. An alt as for for a camera. Yeah. Okay. That has um and I guess they're a bit pricey because they tend to be used in upper end tripods. But they'll have either a three uh, a, a one quarter or a three eighth screw on the bottom and on the top. And the big advantage is instead you don't have to loosen something up all the way and have the risk that it just flops over well see that's my problem is i'm i got this travel tripod and it's got a ball head and it doesn't have like a an arm or anything to adjust it you know yeah so that's that's just the problem he was he was talking about if you have this slow motion it's always locked in position and you can just adjust it uh as as the sun moves across the sky slowly and you never lose it I'll I'll look at getting that. See if it's worth it. I've got a link. Uh, he gave a talk uh, to the Astronomical League, and it's online on their on their Facebook page. I think 
well, their Facebook page, also their Yahoo, their um, uh, YouTube channel. And um, he went over quickly all his tips and tricks and his belief in, uh, in, in how to do the photography. So, um, Alan Dyer uh, did a two part with the uh, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Yeah. And that's and, the most Dyer is the name I was trying to think of. Yeah, he did the Kalamazoo and he just did uh, Astronomical League also. Okay. Gave us so, all they, so, we had two parts of that. One was kind of setting up and doing the actual photography, the second part was processing. If you want to produce some products like an ensemble or a or a, a montage, what do you want to call it? Um, Mosaic, what, yeah. what I was going to mention for Robert was there is a company called Move Shoot Move. Okay. And, and they have a very small uh, rotator that fits on the top of your tripod. And, uh, and you can combine that with a, oh, they call it a Z frame or something or other. Anyway, there's there's a few video tutorials that show how to use that and they are much smaller than uh, even the uh, uh, trackers that ioptron and skywatcher have and okay. if your interest is small uh, I don't know how much money it'll save you but if, if any but it's a lot smaller and lighter weight okay yeah well, that yeah. makes sense and you're not moving it along the direct directly along the direction of motion of the sun but if you can see either through the eyepiece or through the live view the left right up down is the same as what you're going to see in the camera right so you can you can keep things centered that way now in order to make that work you have to be able to basically polar align your tripod right it has to be aligned in the right direction. Actually, this little rotator, well, the rotator can be adjusted in uh, altitude and, of course, in azimuth to get started. And you uh, point the center of that rotator, the threaded part, towards Polaris. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think Polaris is going to be out in, in <laughs> mid-afternoon, but <laughs> there, there are ways. Whatever it is, it's, I think it's going to be... A Around well, if you could set up the night, if you were someplace that you could set up the night. Yeah, I don't think, I don't before. think we're going to be able to do that. I think we're going to be in San Antonio and then we're going to, we're going to go to wherever. Anyway, conceptually, if you can get your head around conceptually about the fact that it needs to point north and basically at uh, Polaris, then when it rotates, it'll rotate only in the RA direction and it should stay on your target. Okay. That's what I'm trying to get across. Yeah, it, it's probably close enough to keep it centered, or to yep. give you most most of the control would be in most of the control you need is in one direction. Could you might have cool. to fine tune the other. Correct, and uh, and just starting off with setting that that rotator at the right uh, elevation, uh, and it has markings on it to make sure you set it at the right elevation. Uh, and also pointing your tripod or pointing the body of this rotator towards north using your compass on your iPhone or whatever you have handy that works the best. Uh, doing those two things should get you in the ballpark so that you do not need to do a formal alignment. But you'll have to watch it and make sure uh, that the sun stays in the, in the field of view uh, on your live view. Okay. Okay. Well, it's uh it's a little bit after 7:30, so let's get started. Well, welcome everybody. This is the uh 12th session of the Novak Eclipse Sig. Uh we have sort of a a mishmash of topics this time. And let me get uh and we have a lot of stuff to talk about. So let me get immediately into the slides. Um and have plenty of time for Greg, who has a presentation on uh, automation and time for Q&A, although I don't know if we have any new people. It looks like there's some new people who are showing up. <clears throat> so let me start sharing my screen and we'll go through the slides. Okay, 
topics for today. We're going to have some announcements. Uh, Greg's going to talk about uh, exposure automation tools and his experience. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, and have an opportunity for people to describe what they're planning on doing uh, for the eclipse as we, we're getting pretty close to April, 67 days. Uh, I have one slide about what Pamela and I are going to do, and I, I hope others will, will chime in about what they've planned. Uh, talk a little bit about opportunities for volunteering uh, uh, around here, primarily before the eclipse, to see if uh, people are willing to do that. Um, I've got a slide about some delving into the use of Sea Star and the Dwarf II uh, for the eclipse and what, what uh, the ways those might be useful. Um, open Q and A, especially if we have some new new people joining who who want to catch up on uh, the minimum of what they need to know to make their own plans to observe, and then we'll talk about future sessions. Uh, one thing I want to uh, remind people is the Kilim um, uh, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society has their um, series, which has very good speakers talking about the eclipse uh, roughly monthly. The next session of that is tomorrow. Um, you can Google Kilimazoo, Ast uh, Kil Kilimazoo um, Astronomical Society, and that'll direct you to the page that has the details. It's, um, I believe it's midday tomorrow. Uh, no, tomorrow evening, uh, seven o'clock or something. It starts and they have Michael Zeiler, who is a... Um, a map maker uh, who's who's one of the people who's made detailed maps so people can do their detailed planning of where they want to be located is the next speaker. And then they've got Fred Espinak and Alan Friedman um, in March coming up. It's a very good series. I, I recommend it highly. Um, some updates on software. Uh, and I think um, Greg's going to mention this, but there's been an update to uh, Capture Eclipse which is a Mac program, Canon only, uh, that has been updated for 2024. So you can check on that. And by the way, all these slides are already posted on the SIG uh, uh, file sharing location on Bitly. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to find all these details. You don't have to take notes now necessarily. Um, okay, so that's Capture Eclipse. There's uh, updated prompting software. This doesn't control cameras, but it just speaks to you about when events during the eclipse are going to happen and make sure that you're ready, whether you're doing photography by hand or you're just observing. It gives you warning when the uh, contact two and contact three in particular. So you have uh, warning for diamond ring and to uh, change your observing mode with or without filters if you need it. And finally, um, Javier Jubier has a uh, exposure calculator, which appears to be very accurate. And I have a slide on that later on too. But uh, when you look at the slides, you'll see this link. And um, you just put in there uh, some parameters of your equipment and it tells you the exposure which is needed for the various phases. Uh, as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, I want to mention that we we got word that there's an opportunity for groups or three of, of three or more who want to do citizen science to help uh, Southworth Research Institute with a project to observe polarization of the corona uh, throughout the duration. So they're looking for people to volunteer and actually get um, honoraria of I think seven hundred fifty is seven hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and an equipment setup that would permit them to make measurements of the polarization of the corona during totality. Uh, they are looking for people for groups that have at least three people, and will be willing to do some practice sessions between now and the eclipse to make sure you know how to use that equipment. Uh, and you can contact them at that uh, size starter. URL, which I have on the slide. Um, I discovered, and it's not really new, uh, but uh, uh, two uh, 
uh, two gentlemen who observed the 2017 eclipse in Wyoming have outstanding photography, uh, HDR photography of the eclipse. Uh, it's fun to just look at it. And if you want to get into more depth, they have uh, some slide presentations they gave at a conference in Europe, in English, um, describing how they did their processing, especially their HDR processing flow. Uh, and their results are amazing. The picture I have here is their um, 150 millimeter focal length full frame HDR image of the 2017 eclipse with which you can see streamers going out to, I don't know, six, seven, eight radii from a dark site in Wyoming. And you can also see the stars in the background. Uh, they did fantastic work. They also have a three minute video which summarizes all of their imagery of the entire eclipse from start to finish, which is also an amazing thing to look at. And uh, we were talking before we, we started the meeting a little bit about Alan Dyer. He gave a presentation at the KAS series. He also gave a presentation to the uh, Astronomical League. And uh, I've got um, the uh, I've got the URL for his book, which is an online book. And wisely, I, I think I bought it for 2017. And not much has changed between then and now. So I'm just going to stand pat on the on the edition I have. But if you're interested in photography or uh, interested in information about the eclipse in general, I think Dyer's book is the go-to one for, uh, for photography details. And if you want to see his presentation, you can just go to the Astronomical League YouTube channel. Uh, and it was about an hour and a half. He, he, he spoke and... Uh, answered questions. Okay, so next up, Greg is going to talk about his experiences with uh, uh, primarily Eclipse Orchestrator, but some of the other software. And uh, I'm just going to, I've got his slides here, if that's okay, and I'm going to let him speak to them. Uh, and as I said, all these slides are already up on the uh, file server. Okay, uh, thanks, Alan. I just mentioned a couple things. First of all, I endorse what Alan said about the uh, Eclipse book that Alan Dyer has together. If you get it online, it has a number of links in it, so it'll take you directly uh, to what he's talking about and actually adds value. I would not recommend buying the hard copy, although if you take the hard copy with you on the plane, it might be easier to read, but I'd recommend it's, I think it's something on the order of about 450 pages. So it covers everything from soup to nuts, including a section at the end about processing. So it's really helpful. Also the guy who, and, and you mentioned another product, Alan, which is called the Solar Eclipse Timer, which you can get for either Android or for Apple, which I have and we used in the 2017 Eclipse, and it works great. I highly recommend that. The author of that also put a similar book together that Alan has, and I, I wish I'd thought about that. I would have provided a link to it, but uh, it's also very helpful. It's also about $8, $9, something like that, uh, but it is organized a little differently. It's organized in the timeline of the actual sequence, whereas uh, Alan has his organized by subject matter. In other words, he talks about what equipment to use. He talks about different approaches to taking pictures, whether with video or uh, uh, a still camera on a, uh, uh, a tripod that's not moving or on a mount, and he gives you all sorts of tips. So they're both useful and they're presented a slightly different way. And uh, I have both because I found them both very useful. And I need to go back and look at them again because there's a lot of material in that. Having said that, uh, I think what got me interested in, in uh, automated uh, photography programs was Alan. He had mentioned Set and See, he would mentioned this Eclipse Orchestrator. So I did a little investigation and this is kind of the results of my investigation. I focused on two things, Eclipse Orchestrator, and actually to a certain extent, Solar Eclipse Maestro. 
I use a little 13 inch MacBook Pro that has a boot camp uh, partition on it. And that's what I normally use for my Windows machine for my astrophotography. So I use that to load up Eclipse Orchestrator. And then when I start up that machine in the uh, Mac OS side, I uh, loaded up uh, Solar Eclipse Maestro. Solar Eclipse on Maestro only uses older Mac, but it does cover Nikon and it was uh, a good fit for me. And then the Capture Eclipse was mentioned already and the Set and C is uh, a Windows Canon only uh, uh, product as well. Okay, so I've got seven slides other than the intro slide, so let's get to that. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So the concept of all of these programs is to specify the parameters that you want for shooting all the different phenomenon on an eclipse. The, the stated benefit of that is once you figure that out and set it in stone in your, in your program, then the program will keep track of the time. They'll keep track of what exposure your camera needs. It'll take care of all that and you can enjoy the experience of the eclipse. Well, I don't know how true that is, probably true by degrees, but you know, you'll feel some measure of anticipation. You'll always be watching to make sure that your image is in the middle of the uh, uh, live view screen. But uh, that's the objective. So uh, the Eclipse Orchestrator is created by the co-owner of Daystar Filters, and he founded this Moonglow Technologies, where you can find this uh, software. And he's got two versions, a free version, which is very limited in what it can cover, and it has a pro version, which is 109 bucks. Um, it does mention that, hey, if you're going to get involved in this, please get involved in it early, because... Someone who calls up a week before the eclipse and wants to buy our pro version and, and get the code to unlock it, we won't give it to them because we'll be on the road uh, for the eclipse and they shouldn't be trying to do this uh, at such last notice. But the general idea is you take a USB uh, cable to whatever port you have on your camera and that goes back to the USB port that you have in your um, computer. Uh, in mine, I've, uh, it's old enough that it has USB-A uh, ports, and then you just need to make sure that the other end of it matches whatever you have uh, on your camera, whether it's a USB-C, whether it's a USB-3, uh, whatever it is. In my case, I've been using the D810 Alpha, which was the Nikon modified Astro Cam uh, version of the D810 that came out uh, probably, what, 2013, 2015, something like that. Um, you can also leverage a second serial number, excuse me, a second serial cable to connect to the wired remote shutter connection, which is generally separate from the USB connection on your camera. And the idea of that I've read about it, I haven't actually experienced it, I've got one on order, is that it will cause the cycle time on your camera to be a lot faster. And so if you want to take a bunch of pictures, for example, around the diamond ring, you can take more pictures because the cycle time uh, is faster and allows you to take more pictures within uh, the certain number of seconds that you have that the, the uh, diamond ring is exposed. Um, and Greg, by the way, um, I, I ordered a serial camera from Hap Griffin on Sunday, uh -huh. and I got a notice that he mailed it today. So oh, he, has them, he has them in stock. Okay. It's interesting. Well, I, I should probably, just to be safe, order, order from him as well. I ordered from the uh, Shoestring Astronomy. Right. That was recommended by somebody so i i just went ahead and did that but um basically it takes another usb cable from your computer and if you don't have enough ports then from your usb hub connected to your computer and it goes to a box 
which converts the uh, USB to serial and then converts the serial on a, I guess, a DB9 uh, connector into whatever uh, the form factor is for the cable that goes into your shutter released, your cable shutter release uh, on your uh, on your camera. So, um, and I mentioned a couple of places where you can get it. Um, Eclipse Orchestrator supports both Canon and Nikron, but doesn't cover the newer cameras like the R5 and Canon, or at least it doesn't list it, list it or the Z7 or Z7 II or Z8 uh, for Nikon. So it's kind of shy on the mirrorless camera side of both Canon and Nikon. Although I found that you can probably get away with some cameras, even though they're not listed, but there may be some wrinkles. For example, and I mentioned this, if I try to plug in a Z7 to Eclipse Orchestrator, it automatically converts my RAW into JPEG fine, even though the script says RAW, even though I started off in RAW. So those kind of things are why you need to practice and make sure uh, that you're comfortable with it. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, and by the way, if you have any questions, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, uh, but I will take my lead from any questions that you may have. So feel free to interrupt me. I just included this so that you'd understand that really the free doesn't have nearly as many um, phenomena during the, doesn't cover as many phenomena during the eclipse. And it uh, includes also some of the um, simulations that are included uh, with the program that you can get uh, with, uh, with the paid version. Uh, it mentions that you can do more than one camera uh, if you have um, the pro version. It says up to 16. But this fella gave the presentation to the uh, Kalamazoo Astronomy uh, Society and basically said, you can't do more than two. And he wouldn't recommend it. So um, that that's just a bragging right that has no meaning. Okay, next, please. Okay, so the setup is, I think, fairly similar on all of them, although the specific places you need to go and the menu system can vary a little bit from, from system to system. For Eclipse Orchestrator, uh, what I did was, first of all, before you start the program, and this is important, you plug in your camera, you turn your camera on, you wait until you get some kind of indication that the computer recognizes the camera and it may be subtle. And then you start up the Eclipse Orchestrator because what happens with Eclipse Orchestrator is it will search for a camera and doesn't find one, you can't get very far in the process. Um, so what I do is I just go to setup and it's, uh, I guess like the fifth one, two, three, four, five, fifth uh, menu item along the top. And you click on that and you get your configuration menu to pop up, uh, configure hardware, hardware configuration, sorry. And then that's where you open it up, you choose what kind of camera you have, you give it a description that you want to use. So it's usually a, a shorter than the full name, uh, you enter the telescope information, you enter or the, the lens that you're using, uh, you choose what mount, you identify the GPS port and features if you're using GPS, you don't have to. Uh, and then you, then I uh, click choose event under setup and I pick, of course, the 2024 April 8 total uh, eclipse, and then it includes Espinac in parentheses, which I think means that he's the one that did the calculations for the uh, for the timing for your 
your camera. Uh, then go to a location and time, put in the location, obviously, uh, or you can choose to have it updated by GPS. And uh, in that, and that's a, that location time is actually a major um, a menu item across the top. That's where you pick whether you want real time, which means it's 66 days away, or you pick simulated time, which means it's starting the whole process, or you pick start at C2, in other words, just before totality, and it goes through 20 second warning, uh, uh, 10 second warning, remove uh, filters, diamond ring, all this other stuff. I, I think I have that a little out of order, but that's the idea. And then it starts actually exercising your camera. Now, one of the things they caution is when you exercise your camera, you should try to do it with a filter on and actually looking at the sun or photographing something. Because if you're just causing the shutter actuation with the body cap on, it is faster than it would ordinarily be if it was capturing a full image, or at least that's what they warn you about. Um, once, once you select the time, and I usually select real time to get started, so it's not going off and trying to start the camera down, down the path of the eclipse, I go to the script wizard, uh, which is under file, as I remember. It's the first item under file. Uh, and I go through that wizard, make sure all my selections previously made are correct and I didn't screw something up. Uh, I identify which items I want to be covered in this sequence during the uh, eclipse. Uh, and then you hit uh, 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 load and it will end up loading a page that has all your script items on it, which I think is really cool. I think I had asked Alan, I said, hey, where'd you get the script for your, for your system? Did, I heard you had a script. Well, the script is actually generated by the program, which is a nice feature. And you don't have to figure out how to program it. You don't have to figure out anything other than making sure that you have the right input up front. So uh, let's see. And then when you hit finish, that's when the uh, script generates and it pops up on your screen. And then once that's popped up and I take a look at it and it all seems to make sense, you know, basic sense, it lists the uh, right camera. Then I go ahead and shift back to a location time and I do a test. And the first test I use do is the C2 uh, test, uh, C2 simulation. And that that's the most difficult part of the entire sequence. So it's the part you want to make sure uh, uh, goes the best. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the real time and you can see, and I did this yesterday, so you can see it says 67 days uh, prior to the camp, prior to the eclipse. And then the actual time and date is at the top. Uh, so that was the 31st of January. And then you can see about in the middle of this page, you can see the current camera. And this is actually recognized by the computer and the software. And it says an icon D810 alpha. And uh, what the exposure time, what the uh, focal ratio is, it's about seven for my uh, uh, telescope. Uh, if I use the field flattener, and it's about uh, five or 5.6, something like that, if I use the uh, reducer. So uh, I'm torn between ISO of 200 or ISO of 100. 200 is the native ISO. Actually, for the D810 alpha, I may use that. That means that your uh, short exposures to catch the diamond ring don't need to be as short, but your long exposures need to be longer. 
So it's uh, it, it's half half a one six and one half a dozen of another, and then you can see in the next uh, column over when it says quality, it says raw. So um, I was finding that it was raw for the uh, Z7 on this uh, script, but it was actually JPEG fine uh, when it took the image, when I reviewed the images. So next slide, please. So once you uh, do your simulated C2, you'll notice that the stuff that's already occurred ends up turning green in the event column towards the top of the uh, of, of the slide. And so that tells you when it occurred. And then second contact through sunset are red, meaning it's still coming up. And uh, below that is the countdown for the, the actual script. And it says 6.4 seconds until uh, the filter's off voice prompt, 7.8 until the diamond ring, et cetera, et cetera. And it's pretty neat to watch. And it seems to be, at least so far, it seems to be uh, uh, pretty reliable. And uh, and it's much easier. Uh, next slide, please. Greg, I'll, I'll just comment. I think one of, the, one of the features that most of these programs offer is that if you're not sure where you'll be setting up, you can create a script for multiple locations. Oh, oh, well, you and can, it, and, it, and then, right. because when you indicate the latitude and longitude, it creates a script that's based on the C4, C1 through C4 at that location. But these are all ASCII files, and you can make up multiple of them. Right. Well, in fact, what you do is you use the script again, and then you save that under a different file name. Right. different location name. And it's very easy to do that. That's an excellent point. Sorry, I glossed over that. Uh, the other thing is they actually provide a feature that automatically calls up uh, a notepad and allows you to edit the script if you right. want to do any of your own editing. Right, so, because it's, it's just a text file. Exactly. And you can exactly. see those things. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Next, please. So that was kind of a short introduction to say the least. Here are some things that are remaining. I am not a pro. I tried to emphasize to Alan that I did the 2017 Eclipse. I didn't use automated uh, software. I used the uh, uh, bracketing and the uh, um, oh, uh, intervalometer. Uh, yeah, intervalometer um, that is already built into the D810. So that's what I use. And then I adjusted uh, the exposure uh, as we got uh, to different events around totality, uh, but still left the uh, uh, bracketing in place. I will have to say that I did miss the diamond ring uh, at least didn't get a great picture of it. I got a little bit of the uh, Bailey speeds, but I'm hoping this uh, software will help me uh, actually capture that in, in all its glory this time. Um, let's see. So install and test the serial trigger cable. We talked about that already and where to get it. Uh, I'd like to see how that works and figure out uh, how much better that is. Uh, there is an emergency script that you can invoke. Uh, and my understanding is that's in the event of cloud cover so that you can bring it in and then kick it out as necessary, depending on presence of clouds or anything else that's uh, interfering with your ability to capture the eclipse. I, I, I am not qualified to talk about that yet. Um, I want to explore the various windows and graphics that are available under the other uh, menu items. Some work, some don't. For example, there is a live view window that you can use uh, for your camera, but it doesn't work for Nikon. So there are some uh, quirks that 
if you choose to use this, you'll have to figure it out. And that's kind of a concern for me because either the live view or the image review is what I use after each uh, set of images to make sure that I'm still centered uh, and in some cases uh, focused uh, on, the, on the sun. Um, I loaded both Eclipse Orchestrator, I think as I mentioned, and Solar Eclipse Maestro on the computer, one on the uh, Windows side, one on the uh, uh, Mac OS side. They seem to work very similarly. I'm not sure which one will be the best, although um, the fella who created, and uh, what, what I do with his name, um, Solar Eclipse Maestro, who's in the hospital, um, said he would come out with a new update that would add a few cameras. I think specifically the Z8 uh, for uh, not Eclipse Orchestrator, but uh, uh, Solar Eclipse Maestro. Uh, the fella who is the co-owner of Daystar Filters, who wrote Eclipse Orchestrator, has on his website that there will be an update uh, just before this eclipse. He kind of admitted during the uh, presentation that he probably won't get around to doing that prior to this April eclipse. Uh, but having said that, he still covers uh, a, a lot of cameras uh, with his uh, software. And then uh, as a low priority, I'd be interested in experimenting with two cameras running off the script. Uh, but I don't know that I'm going to uh, actually pursue that. Uh, next, please. And we so, need, Greg, we need to move on, sort of. Okay. Um, Go over this quickly. As I said, uh, most of these are the same. Uh, I mentioned some of the limitations of the uh, different uh, software. Uh, Alan mentioned Capture, Eclipse, and Set and See, and uh, I did buy a GPS recommended by somebody, I can't remember who, worked well, it could have been Alan Dyer, and uh, again, I'm going to try out that uh, shutter control serial cable, and I'll let you know how it went. I think yeah, some, of these, some of these guys have been motivated to write the software because they were, they, they were shipborne, and... Um, they wouldn't know their position until the last minute. Right. right. So they needed the GPS feature. Um, and um, set and see is a little bit different because it does it differentially. And if you change position, you don't have to change the script. It calculates it from C2 and C3 uh, based on where you are. So that's, a, that's an interesting quirk in that one. But it has other limitations because it can't do everything. Okay, do people have questions about uh, about what Greg's talked about? This would be a good time to to get those before we forget and go on. Yeah, so I had one quick question about it shooting JPEG fine instead of raw on the Nikon. Are these files being saved to the card in the camera, or are they being offloaded over USB to the computer? Save to the camera. Okay. Yeah, I'm a fellow Nikon shooter myself, so I understand a lot of the frustration about everyone not supporting Nikon. Um, so thank you. Sure. And, and along those lines, one of the suggestions in testing is to go through the entire sequence you script from the beginning to the end of partial to see how much storage you use on your onboard card and make sure that you have a card that's big enough for all the images you've asked to be saved in raw. Okay. Um, and then one other quick question on that. Um, so with these Eclipse Orchestrator software programs, whether it's Solar Maestro or um, the Eclipse Orchestrator, are these, when they're connected to the camera via USB, are they changing settings on the camera? So they're changing the ISO automatically or the shutter speed they at certain are. points? They are. Okay. Absolutely. And I, I, what was I going to mention? The other thing to check when you do this end-to-end -end test 
is count up the number of actuations that the script required and the number of actuations you actually got. Because there are timing issues that they warn about. And if you have the wrong timing, you may not get all of the, uh, all the actuations. Yeah, good point. Robert? Yeah, just a quick question. Does anybody have experience with Capture Eclipse? Because that seems like it may be the best fit for me because I have a, a Mac and a newer Canon camera. Uh, I have a friend who has delved into it at my recommendation because I found it in, I think, Alan Dyer's book. He mentions it, uh, and I'd never heard of it before. And he's been happy with it uh, so far. The reason it was a non-starter for me is that the 13-inch MacBook Pro that I use uh, with the boot camp uh, um, for uh, astroimaging is an older, I don't know, uh, Yosemite or something. And it only goes back so far uh, for uh, uh, Capture Eclipse. You have to have a, a, a newer Mac OS for that. In addition to newer cameras, you have to have a newer newer Mac OS. OK. Thank you, Greg. Uh, that was yeah, I've had, uh, Oh, sorry. I've been playing around with Capture Eclipse pretty extensively, and it looks really good so far. Back to a couple of points already made. It does have a calibration feature that can go through and do a simulation to test your camera read write timing. So it factors that in to the critical Bailey's beads section window. So it can factor the number of exposures it's going to do in that time frame. So you do get back to making sure you don't have drop frames. And Capture Eclipse will tell you at the end of a session, you've dropped, you didn't capture this many sets of frames if you don't have that calibrated accurately. So that's a very good point. You want to make sure that you it it's factored into the the um the script about how many exposures to take during that critical rapid fire phase. And capture clips seems to do that nicely. Okay. Good point. Thanks, Jeff. And because of that timing thing, that's why this uh, additional shutter uh, cable is advertised as being helpful. Yeah, because they're not wasting USB bandwidth on just pressing the shutter button. It's responding right away and the time's available right right afterwards to, uh, to uh, after, it checks as soon as it's written to the onboard card it's free to shut to set the shutter off again. Anyway, okay. Yeah, that was a big miss for me back at 2017 when I was using Magic Lantern and a T3i. I really hadn't planned on photographing, but Brent Maynard had really set me up and made it automated. And I'm like, okay, I'll do this. But yeah, we lost a lot through that Bailey's Beads diamond ring section there. And we just never quite got it synced up. So. I'm hopeful. <laughs> You'll never know until we get there. <laughs> but it looks good so far. Yeah, that's what every every time the person says they've updated the software for the new Eclipse, uh, there's a little yeah. bit of a risk and there, too. There's one. I don't know if you've run the, the Capture Eclipse update, but there's some kind of a, a glitch with the compact flash card or your card needs to have images on it because if it doesn't, there's some kind of a, a, a freeze up that happens between IO, the Mac operating system and the Canon camera. So just make sure you have images on your compact flash card when you boot everything up. It, it's a warning that pops up when you start capture eclipse, but a little bit of a bizarre thing. And like you said, Alan, you know, we're kind of updating here going into the, the fourth quarter. Yeah. That that's a Mac phenomenon. Yeah. As Mac far as OS. I know, yeah, it's a Mac phenomenon. Yes. Okay. That program only works on Mac. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that could really get you. You'd say, okay, I'm going to clean off my disc, make sure it's empty just before I start. 
and then nothing happens at all. <laughs> and then panic ensues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody afterwards explains what you did wrong. Not happy. Okay. All right, I've got one slide of of, of my plans. Uh, let me let me uh, ask the the group if anyone would like to describe briefly what they plan to do now that we're getting close and um, uh, we basically heard from Greg quite a bit, but um, people especially who might have something a little bit oddball or, but tell us you know where you're going and what you're trying to accomplish whether you're going to be visible or visual or photographic. Robert, I appreciate your raising your hand, so you can go first. Okay, so I'm going with a group uh, that's going to start out in San Antonio, and we're going to end up for the day of the eclipse in a place called Kerrville, Kerrville Texas. Um, it's supposedly, I'm assuming it's right on the center of the path. Um, I'm going with a group that's headed by the astronaut Tom Jones, and the advantage of going with him is this guy is extremely well organized. He knows everything <laughs> about what he's doing. And uh, he uh, he typically goes to a place where there's a group that wants to have him talk. And so he does a talk too, but um, he's just very organized. He get he, you know, kind of leads the whole group and takes us on side trips where we need to go and and just is very enjoyable because it's sort of like I can let him do all the organizing and I just follow. <laughs> so um, I don't have to do a lot of thinking. And then afterwards, we're going to go to uh, Big Bend National Park. You have a um, a, a developed location where you're going to be do the, doing the observing? Yes. Is it at, at a hotel or a park or something? I think it's in a school parking lot or something like that. Okay. All right, somebody else? What we got? Jeff, what are you doing? You must know by now. I don't know the location. We're going wherever we have to go. I'm totally open. We'll just wait one week out. We'll. I've got contingency plans. The last time I checked, Memphis still has pretty reasonable hotel rates. So if I have to get to Texas, Memphis will be my staging area. I got a sister in Western Kentucky. If I need to get to Indiana, I do have a contact from the Almost Heaven Star Party that knows state forests in Indiana, uh, and so he's a contact there. I'm all photography. Um, it's all automated. The thing I'm doing differently is I'm switching to 120 frames per second camera capture. I really my main goal is video production, and I want to capture that brief Bailey's beads at 120 frames per second. And I've got, I want to do some things with that from still compositing to um, being able to really get four to five seconds of video rate at maybe 30 frames per second to show that high definition, a good 4K, 120 frame per second capture of Bailey's beads. I don't see anything like that online. And that's that's something I'm trying different. I'm, I'm pretty intense on uh, working on that right now. <laughs> Are you trying to be on the central line itself um, or close as close so. as possible? Well, um, I mean, I, I hadn't looked at the uh, kind of a more of a grazing uh, opportunity for that. Maybe I, I wouldn't be opposed to that right now. I'm kind of, do you think that would be, be would be better? Oh, and I did have a question, but do you think that would be better to go? We did that for the annular. You know, we we went to the yeah. edge. Well, um, Dunham, uh, Dunham, um, sent to bring up the name. I wanted to get. I wanted to get into this conversation. Yeah, uh, he sent a letter trying to advocate people to go to the edge of totality. Okay, I missed that. So it's a general. He sent it out to the group. Uh, I don't know what. I don't know in what context I saw it. Okay, but you probably should contact him. And I'll find him anyway because I want to. My main goal is artistic composition and presentation. But um, if I capture what I want, I want to have some timing, some accurate timing associated with it. And I wanted yeah. to talk to him about how best to do that 
If it's right. just and audio triggers on the video file, the problem is my 120 frame rate will not capture audio at the time. So I I don't I hate to put something on screen as a countdown, but I might. I, I want to just pursue some options there. Yeah, and I I think he's also connected with the people who would be doing detailed predictions of where the beads would appear with okay. precise calculation of the lunar libration and getting a, a, a profile for this eclipse of the mountains so that they can mm -hmm. really anticipate. But he was hoping for people who would be at the edge and could help with the precise timing because he looks at it, it's just one more occultation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and and edge observations of occultations are always some of the most valuable. So yeah, talk Thank to you. Dave Dunham. I need to reach out. He's he's on my list. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. I mean, I, I was just okay. gonna say that I mean there's reasons to, you know, for an annular eclipse to go to the edge because you know, for the annular, I mean, people go to the center because they like to get a perfect circle, but on the edge you, you get extended beads and and it, it's really fascinating. But for totality, I mean, if you're on the edge, you're gonna have you know, minimal time for the corona. And that's, right. that's like really, I don't know, not, I mean, that's where I think most people are there for. I mean, that's what's fascinating. So, you know, you'd be and, given a lot to go to the edge for a total eclipse. I like to say. And <laughs> that was my it. reaction to Dunham that I said that was going to be a tough sell. <laughs> it is. It is even for me. I, I can still capture uh, because compositively, compositely, you know, the symmetrical Bailey's beads. And if I capture 120 frames per second, I can have, uh, you know, many frames symmetrically presented in tight, uh, tight formation that I think would present what I'm going for here in addition to the video. And I think if I do it right, I'll get plenty of definition on both. The, I know one side is probably worse than the other, right? But there's always one side of the moon that doesn't have hardly any Bailey's beads and the other one's good. But uh, if, well, if, and and that would depend on a case by case basis exactly what mm -hmm. lunar latitude is at the edge. Well, I don't know if that varies from eclipse to eclipse, but you know that's the kind of thing Dunham and his his mm -hmm. people understand. And if, if you've done ten or fifteen of these, then fine, you know, do what Dunham says. But if if this is your second or third one, you want to be near the center line. You know? no, no. Yeah. yeah, but uh, but uh, Jeff has a good project in mind, and if you're just barely inside, you'll still get a little. You'll you'll get some. You'll get prominences certainly, and you'll get corona in, inner corona. Uh, and you you know the HDR techniques. You can put them together. Sounds interesting. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to volunteer to talk about where they're going? I'm planning to go to uh, Cleveland just for visual observation. But uh, I'm still worried about the clouds. Because somebody told me that Cleveland is a very cloudy area. I don't know. Any any thoughts from anybody? Well, that's what that's what Pamela and I are planning on doing, too. We're going to be uh, at Geneva on the lake because, I, uh, yeah. because we read about the, um, at least climatologically, a bit of a, a potential for cloud clearing off of Lake Erie. And um, uh, as I said, I've got a slide about, about that later on. So I made the same decision. Didn't want to go. Didn't want to go as far as Texas um, and, and get the uh, the other way to get clear skies, which is to be down. Actually, you want to be it uh, in, in Mexico, but Mexico. Yeah. Uh, to really get a probability, a high probability of seeing it. Yeah. But the um, the marginal climatological advantage of southern texas versus being within a day um we just decided to go to the south shore of lake erie and uh take our chances there i, I heard from one group saying that uh Cleveland is better in the northern part um even if you go further up north it'll be more cloudy um the other yeah for, that uh, you know cleveland may not be all that good for uh Generally, the cloudiness increases as you go further northeast. Yeah. And I think it gets quite a bit worse when you get beyond Buffalo. 
You go to Buffalo, you're risking snow in April. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any time of the year, right? <laughs> yeah, well, people have pointed out that there's a potential for a beautiful eclipse in the environment view from the Canadian side of uh, Niagara Falls. I see. The eclipse would be seen over the falls from the area of uh, Ontario Hydro in in, uh, in Ontario on the other side of uh, uh, on the other side of the of St Lawrence Seaway from Buffalo, and uh, there's not a really any place else except maybe some areas along the Rio Grande where um, the eclipse really occurs in any place that's particularly scenic. I think I don't know. Well, the other thing is that it's going to be at such a high altitude, especially down there. You know, 70 yeah, so feet. it's not going Hard to be directly to over the yeah over the scenery. It's going to be way up. Right. Right. Okay. Um, anybody else, or should we move on? I have yeah, plans. I oh, oh, Lloyd, yeah. You want to go first? Yeah, go ahead, Lloyd. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I think I mentioned before, but yeah, well, we're going to be going that, down to Kerrville as well you know as other people uh, have mentioned uh uh you know we're we actually have plans i've been working with a friend uh who works at uh, griffith observatory and we actually met up in 2015 at an eclipse up in svalbard did a uh uh like a group uh in 2017 in douglas Wyoming. but now we've, we're arranged with the uh, trina university in kernel to uh, use part of their soccer field and we're gonna have you know, he's bringing a lot of group. I'm bringing a lot of friends and family, and and it should, it should be uh, should be pretty good. Okay, thanks, Lloyd. Did somebody else speak up? I didn't. Right here. Oh, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, me, Jared. I, I can tell Daniel you're going to be going to Texas. Yeah, you you are. Wherever the eclipse is, you'd be going to Texas. I yeah, know. yeah. Um, uh, me and Jared Roberts and the, his partner are we're all going to Texas. So. In an RV, hopefully don't get stuck. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. What are you um, going to What are you going to observe with? Uh, or, let's see. Or photograph with? I haven't really fully decided. Um, probably white light at this point. Um, just a. Uh, I'm thinking, just with just um, a white light filter on one of my tele telescopes. I'm not trying to go crazy here. Um, and we're going to be there for a week, so I'll be doing some nighttime stuff too, but I'll, I'll probably be doing, I'm leaning towards visually seeing it, because I don't want to deal with all the camera equipment, <laughs> if that makes sense, and like miss some, some something, because my head's like glued in, glued into the, into the computer, so that's, uh, that's sort of what I'm, I'm debating between visual and, but I'm leaning towards visual, so a little 102 refractor. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on. And uh, Pamela and I, as I mentioned, we're going east of uh, Cleveland on Lake Erie, where the eclipse will be between 1 and 3.30. And we've checked the sun is nice and high, 48 degrees, and it'll be 3 minutes and 50 seconds if it's clear. Um, the, there are highways up and down there to get almost as far south as indianapolis or as far north as buffalo if if we had to relocate but that's not our intent really to to hope for good good viewing someplace near cleveland um visually going to use canon image stabilized binoculars those have been very successful for all kinds of applications and as people mentioned have mentioned before um cut out some foam that goes over both lenses and and holds the uh, uh, the neutral density six material, so I can watch the partial phases. Um, primarily, uh, I just recently bought a used uh, modded uh, Canon Rebel T5, and um, which is an 800 megapixel APS-C camera. Um, we've got a 300 millimeter Nikon lens with a 1/4 telextender, so. 420 millimeter setup and um, going to 
because we'll be driving, I'm going to drag my uh, my German Equatorial, the the Iaptron Sem. Um, my my takeaway from 2017, I used an Iaptron tracker, and um, in retrospect, I think I was lucky that nothing went wrong with that. So I'd rather have something with some heft to it, as long as I'm not flying to the location. And once I get it set up before the eclipse, it'll it should track dead on without any problems. Um, bring along a lithium battery so I don't depend on having any kind of shore power be autonomous as far as that goes for three hours. And um, have some other cameras that can take pictures of the scene just sitting on a tripod. I also recently got a C star. I'm going to bring that along. Um, not quite sure what it would do, uh, but as I'll mention later on, I checked with some of the manufacturers about how they should perform during eclipses, and I'll talk about that. Um, I've also been delving into the exposure business. The um, the automated programs, such as the ones that Greg described, uh, and Set and C, which is the one I've been looking at. They pop up with suggested exposure scales, but I got to wonder uh, exposure sequences for the partial and total uh, eclipse phases. Uh, but I got to wondering how the various recommendations compared. And on the right here, you see some of them. I looked at uh, Dyson's book and Brett Espinak's book. Um, I also looked for yucks at uh, my 1963 Eastman Kodak booklet on how to photograph the eclipse and uh, Javier Joubier's, uh online calculator, which we were talking about earlier, um, and tried to compare them. There, there's some ambiguity in what people call Prominences in a corona, middle corona, outer corona. So it makes it a little bit hard to compare. But converting them all to EV values, uh, which I won't go into now because we're, we're running a little bit late, but um, which was a standardized measurement, both of the brightness of the thing you're photographing and therefore of the exposure necessary to capture it, assuming linearity, um, they're fairly consistent. And uh, I, I find that uh, Joubier's calculations seem to be sort of the most convincing. Um, he has a lot of detail, a lot of precision. And just this afternoon, took advantage of the sun being out for a while today. Um, I went through with my camera set up to see what exposure worked best for the normal sun, which corresponds to the partial phases. And I ended up with an EV value of uh, 15.6 with my ND5 solar filter, which corresponds pretty well to what Juvier recommends in his calculation. So that's one data point. A, that I'm not totally out of line with my exposures and that I'm in agreement with his. Uh, one of the other features that he has in his program is he factors in atmospheric attenuation um, <clears throat> of 0.2 stop at about 48 degrees elevation, which is where the sun will be what we're observing. And if it was as far down as 30 degrees from some observation points further northeast, uh, it's 0.4 stop. All these numbers are in units of um, photographic stops, which are factors of two. So um, if you're looking to set your camera or to set a script, I'd recommend you look at, uh, at Jubier's calculator. And one of the things to keep in, keep in mind, it doesn't matter too much how you do these steps from prominences and the inner corona all the way out to the outermost corona. It's just that you need to step through this entire range in some reasonable way, given your camera setup. 
and how fast you can change exposures. Uh, in uh, Espinac's book, he mentions this range as being useful, EVs 15.3 to 3.5, and that's that's consistent with what Jubier's calculations predict. So um, as, as people say, there's almost no bad exposure during the eclipse, as long as you're taking fairly long exposures, because the corona goes from bright at the inside, relatively bright at the inside, to very, very faint at the outside. Uh, some of what you'll be able to accomplish for the outer corona and whether or not you get earth shine will depend on how dark the sky is where you are. And how dark the sky is depends on how close you are to the edge of totality um, and also how much dust or haze or whatever else is in, in the atmosphere. There's not much you can do about that. Uh, it's just a question of trying, especially if you have one of these automated setups and step through these things. And what people recommend normally is you start at the beginning of totality, getting the prominences and the inner corona, then step through to the longer exposures at the outer corona, and then step back to um, the prominences again. One thing to consider is that the prominences you see at the beginning of totality are different possibly than the prominences you'll see at the end of totality because the moon is actually moving across the sun. And the moon at this eclipse is going to be 5% larger than the sun. So uh, you want to, if you're going to be compositing the imagery in post-processing in some way, you want to get photos of the prominences both at the beginning and at the end of totality, which will give you more. Uh, the outer corona doesn't change anything because the moon's not moving in front of the outer corona. Just something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, any any questions on what people have brought up about observa observation, yeah, observation plans uh, so far? Or what I just mentioned about exposure times. Okay. So I'll mention a couple of things about opportunities for outreach. We've had some, uh, Novak has, has received some inquiries about um, getting presentations at various school or library groups before the eclipse to get people ready. And um, we've we've given the requesters some feedback that says, well, the the hardcore eclipse observers are not going to be available the weekend before, or, or maybe even the week before, because they'll be traveling out to the eclipse or getting their last minute preparations done. But um, it would be useful if people who are in the group would. Um, let me know if they're available to give presentations to groups. And this isn't the normal Novak uh, kind of a presentation where you just go out there with a telescope at night. It would be an issue of um, speaking to a group indoors and explaining about the eclipse and what they'll see here, which is partial only, of course, um, what they can expect and what they shouldn't expect to see. So give them a little bit about the nature of eclipses and the nature of observing partial eclipses probably pass out solar sunglasses, solar viewing glasses that Novak has. Um, and then that would be tied up if it's during the day, maybe some white light solar observing if it's clear, or if the presentation is at night, then go out with uh, a more typical Novak outreach presentation with a telescope outside. If you're willing to do that, let me know. Um, I think that this group will be occupied on the 8th, but other people in Novak who stay around will be involved in, in some uh, public events on the day of eclipse. We know that um, uh, Sky Meadows will have something going on. I'm a little bit dubious that people will find it worthwhile to drive out to a dark site to see the sun. Um, there are much easier ways to see the eclipse than driving out to um, 
Fakir County, I guess it's in. But uh, Novak will be working with the park uh, to provide some support. And if it's like the partial eclipse in October, we'll also have requests for support from Fairfax County Parks, from uh, Observatory Park with the Analemma Society in Great Falls, and some other locations. So um, those opportunities are not so much for this group, but if, if you can help beforehand, that would be great. Um, and there's some uh, training opportunities versus an organization called SEAL, which is science something or other for libraries, uh, which is an organizing group that uh, tries to do STEM work with libraries, and they have some training available. Alan? Yep. Yes. On, on a related topic, those of us hardcore people that will be going to Texas or wherever will also have impromptu outreach opportunities. I was wondering if the, if we could uh, uh, obtain a, a small pack of, uh, of glasses to take with us. Yeah, um, Woody has, well, Woody has the uh, bulk of the glasses, which we have, I think there are quite a few left from the purchase that was sponsored by MITRE. Um, I don't have many of those. Uh, I may try to divvy up what he has. Uh, I just asked uh, recently what his plans are, and they've had them at meetings in the past. There should be more available. I also am getting some directly from the American Astronomical Society. They put out a notice about uh, having some available. So I'll have some hundreds at my house and and talk to me offline of, of uh, offline and we'll we'll figure something out. But yeah, we should have them to pass out. Um, one of the things I did in 2017 was just cut up some of the bulk material I have, which you can just hold over your face as a strip. You don't really need the glasses. Uh, and uh, safely look because they're they're good quality. It's good quality filter material. But yes, we'll figure out some way to to make it available. Just a a, a quick add on to that. Uh, um, Paul Severance had passed a bunch of them to me, and I'm passing the ones that I have to to Candy tomorrow. Now there are twelve hundred in that box. Okay, so she has them for the outreach, primarily. Yeah. I basically, I, I took uh, about 150 of them that are going to Analemma, and the 1,200 that are left are going to Candy. So she'll have them back for uh, to pass out to various Novak people. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Dan. I have some old uh, filters, which viewing uh, filters, paper kind of thing that I used for the last eclipse. Can it be reused or do they? Oh, yeah. They're fine. They don't, uh, there's been some testing. Most of the standard materials don't degrade. Some of the thinner material, the aluminized mylar, it's a, yeah. it's a little bit easier to puncture that. And, and that could be a problem, but I'm actually using, I'm actually using solar glasses from the transit of mercury uh, many years okay. before the eclipse and, uh, and they're fine. They don't degrade. Okay. There, there's some, there are some there's some advice online that says if there's a pinhole, you can't use them. And that's just silly. Yeah. Um, it's it's not that kind of a of a threat, uh, a, a risk. So as long as most of it is clear, it is uh, in good condition, you can continue to use them. But they're pretty tough. OK, yeah, thanks. OK. All right. Uh Alan, just one other thing about glasses. Um, I ended up ordering a very cheap pair of Eclipse binoculars, but they were 10 by 42. I think they were uh, Celestron from B&H for $79. And with it came a set of 20 uh, glasses. Now you would say, well, why are you asking about glasses? Well, because I sent those to a friend uh the entire package as a as a gift and i don't have possession of those but 
for those of you who haven't used uh, binoculars that are fitted with uh, uh, filters, it's actually pretty uh, a pretty nice thing to have around your neck and just look up whenever you need to or want to. It uh, gives you a good view. And they're cheap. Yeah. Well, I, I, I still... Can you take the filters off of those binoculars? Well, my understanding is the eclipse view or whatever it's called from Celestron, you can't. Although I haven't had them in my hand, so I don't know whether that's true. The ones I got equally cheap before 2017, absolutely. They were uh, had yellow caps and had a... Uh, um, uh, a plastic uh, threaded screw that would then screw on uh, the ends of, of each of the objectives. And that's even better because once the eclipse over, you can just take those little uh, yellow caps off and use them as regular binoculars. Yeah, I would, I would think that's a, a much more enticing way to do it than get something which you can only use to look at the sun occasionally and uh, just add to clutter, it seems. But um, yeah, they work on that. And, and I've noticed they also sell uh, properly vetted uh, eclipse glasses that look more like regular glasses and are more comfortable. I find the cardboard ones very uncomfortable. And every time I see pictures of, of kids, they're usually squishing it on their face anyway. They're not just laying it right on their ears because uh, I, I don't think they really cut very effectively. But a couple more things. Um, I mentioned before that I had um, I, I had looked into what happens when you use um, some of the new integrated telescopes. Um, certainly both the Dwarf 2 and the, and the Sea Star should work fine providing coverage for the partial phases uh, because partial phases is just like looking at the sun and um, white light. And uh, both of those are designed for that. Um, in both cases, you should also be able to set them up to collect raw so that you can process them along with, with your other images um, and, and select out the best or stack them as, as you please. Um, they should track properly at the solar rate, and this is one of the things I asked the ZWO people about the uh, about the C star, whether it would track through totality, uh, because it's a little bit obscure whether they're actually tracking on the sun or tracking at the solar rate. If they tracked on the sun, I'd be a little bit worried that it would lose lock during totality and go off and point who knows where. Um, but they they seem to confirm that it should track through totality fine. Now, what either of those cameras would do as far as exposure during totality, I have no idea. It's a total mystery. And I think we'll probably not find that out until people report back after this eclipse how they behaved, because the manufacturers in both cases are not revealing what mysteries they have inside to do to do their photography. Um, and in both cases, you've got a solar filter which has to be removed. On the Sea Star in particular, because it has a built-in light pollution filter, um, and it's basically an unfiltered CMOS chip, uh, because the the light, what they call a light pollution filter, does pass a large fraction of white light and H alpha, it should do quite well in getting the prominences. Um, the Dwarf 2, I don't know. Uh, uh, I've mentioned to some of you, I actually sold mine. I was disappointed with it. So um, I'm not experimenting with that at all. I do have the Sea Star. I'm going to play with it um, just because it's something I can easily bring along, set up, and see what it does. That's all. Okay. Uh, a little bit of time for any open Q&A. Anybody have anything they wanted to bring up? 
Uh, Greg. Yeah, sorry to monopolize the discussion tonight, but I did want to mention for those people who will be taking a equatorial mount, uh, at least to Texas, uh, totality occurs right about the time of the meridian flip. And so there are a number of ways uh, to manage that, but you need to practice and figure out what your strategy is going to be. My strategy is I'm taking a little uh, uh, mount, the uh, Rainbow Astro RST-135, and in its hand controller, you can just push a knob or push a button, and it will flip regardless of where you are in the sequence. So I'm going to flip it even before I start. And it will, uh, and I've checked it with the altitude of the, uh, the sun, it will uh, then track it around. Uh, it'll be in counterweight up, if you want to call it that, and then it'll track around into its normal position on the other side, but it will not be interrupted during the uh, during the meridian flip, but it is a concern if you have an equatorial mountain, you are going to Texas. Um, that's something um, I think Alan Dyer has mentioned in his presentation. I guess he's he's run into that that uh, you can get a nasty you can get a nasty surprise if you don't uh, anticipate that properly. So thanks for bringing that up. Anybody else have something they want to contribute or ask? Okay. Well, the last topic is what to do about any future meetings. Uh, I'll try to schedule a, a final session before the, um, the eclipse in the first weeks of March. Um, that may just be a, a chance to get together and talk. I don't have... I've sort of run out of topics to try to bring up unless someone has a suggestion for something I can try to put together or get someone to speak to us about. But uh, I think any of us who have some time available will be getting getting things ready for the eclipse. Uh, does that make sense to people to just have an open an open mic session at the beginning of March? Uh, the alternative might be to... Um, as it says on the right there, to um, try to schedule another hands-on practice session where people can get together and um, hopefully have their finalized setup. March is not necessarily the most pleasant time to try to get together and and uh, outside and, and try to find the, a clear shot at the sun. But it's a possibility we could do that, like we did in the fall at... Uh, at uh, Analemma, I'll look into that and uh, and see what makes sense. And that would be separate from having uh, one final get together in March for the for the SIG. Um, okay, and then I was I was beginning to say, do we want to have something in person late April or beginning of May, uh, hopefully to celebrate our success in, on April 8th, that would require somebody taking the action to uh, to figure out where and when and what. Uh, do we just want to have a, a, a meeting someplace where we show slides, or do we want to have a dinner or something more social along those lines? Uh, I don't know. That's, I'm just going to throw that out there. Maybe we can discuss it on on the emails, get more people involved and um, and see what people want to do. I think uh, I think after the annual eclipse we find out we found out that quite a few people were willing and happy to share their results. And I expect will be even more so after the total because uh, with people going all over the place, I'm confident that some number of us will have good things to show. Any thoughts? Okay. Saturday, um, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. May the 4th be. <laughs> <laughs> All 
a favorite of us all. Okay. We know where to get the t-shirts, right? <laughs> That's true. I might have a few left over from a couple years ago. <laughs> I know. All right. Well, I think that's it then. And uh, until uh, until March then. Uh, but I appreciate those of you who have shown up and contributed. Thanks very much, Greg. Appreciate the effort you put in. And we'll see you in March.